this week's podcast is brought to you by Joe's Cafe. Um, they are our sponsor because he made me breakfast this morning. Well, he bought the milk, but no, he did. Uh, Joe's Cafe is in Orem, so go ahead and check it out if you're a Utah local. Uh, I know right now during COVID, they are doing like curbside delivery and stuff and actual delivery. Um, so be sure to check them out. It's one of the best restaurants in uh, Utah County. All right, let's get it started in here, nerd. Blah, 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 blah. All of that chit chat's going to get you hurt. I'll bring you in warm. Or I can bring you in cold. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Oh, toss a coin to your witcher, a friend of humanity. Thank you. So this week we have as a guest Robert W. Ross. Um, how are you doing, Robert? Doing well. All things considered for 2020, that means I'm not on fire at the moment. <laughs> right, at the moment. <laughs> May happen at some point during the year. Any, at any point during the day, yeah. <laughs> Randomly combust. That's awesome. And uh, for, for our nights, that's what we call our followers, if you remember, uh, our good friend uh, Nick, the narrator, uh, is featured in your book. So we're super excited to finally tie the worlds together uh, from author to narrator to us. Awesome. So you guys did a podcast with Nick already? Yeah, we did one. Yeah. Um, how long ago is that, Johnny? Maybe two months ago, three months ago? Yeah, two months. Uh, if I, I wish I had known. I would have seeded you with embarrassing questions for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he let us You actually. I don't know if you knew this. We said Nick did oh. shameless plugs for us. And he said, oh, check out my writing friend um, and read his book. And so I downloaded it and finished it uh, maybe a month after we interviewed Nick. Um, you know, all, all I needed was his uh, go ahead for me to do it. And then I left your review five stars on Audible. So <laughs> it's a very yeah. nice review. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you, uh, it was just the, um, the Paradigm series, not the Sentinels one, just the pair. Or have you done both now? Correct. Just Trinity's Children. Got it. I haven't done so any you know, other work. So I, Nick I, and I, we actually met on a different, in a different series that I'm now, the sixth book just went to him this week. Oh, really? So, uh, Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, Paradigm is is um, is actually a new collaboration uh, with uh, in coordination with Podium Audio, and that was um, that one went to market was released in August, obviously, and that's probably what he which one he was talking about. But yeah, he and I have been working together for like six years now, um, uh, and uh, started off with my first uh, fantasy series, and then moved into the sci-fi series, which is the one you just referenced. So what? So. Help me out. Paradigm is the fantasy series, correct? No, Paradigm 2045 sci is sci-fi. Yeah. Okay. And it's That's, Trinity's Children. Trinity's Children is the first book of three. The second one is, is Humanity's Promise. That's the cover that you see there. Um, <laughs> and um, the last one is Omandi's Demon. Okay. Um, and that's the third book in that series. Very nice. Okay, cool. That's what I thought. I, I just love how uh, I was going to plug... Nick play, plugged it to us by saying, if you want to hear me doing a woman Russian accent, check this out. And I was like, done, you sold me. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and he, he does it real well. I mean, he makes me like, I'm, I could change teams for that sound. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he, yeah, he does good. He cracked me up because he's, you know, we kind of said, all right, do some voices for us. And he was like, if you want to hear voices, check out my next book. Because they <laughs> stretched my limits on this one. Yeah. Um, the, uh, in the Sentinel series, I, well, so once we started and became friends, and in addition to colleagues, I put um, a little Easter egg in each of my books where I tortured Nick. <laughs> so um, in, in the, um, I think it was the third book, I had him, have you ever seen White Christmas? This is topical for the time this is coming out. Have you ever seen the movie White Christmas with yeah. uh, um, Bing Crosby? Um, so there's a scene there where, where Rosemary Clooney, and I think it's Vera Allen, uh, the two, the Haynes sisters, they do this, they do this dance with uh, feather boas, right? They're doing this. And um, so uh, I had uh, the two female characters in my book were acting that out in a Christmas uh, party. And so I had Nick do um, a duet with himself as two women, one of whom was Scottish. So um, 
so it was really great uh, because, uh, I mean, and he has really great attention to detail because I, I went and we blend the voices together. So you sound, they sound like they're tapping at the same time. Uh, and I was like, well, how come, how come they're not exactly the same words? He says, well, because they're, they're handing off. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> like it's a, good, it's a good thing one of us is paying attention. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that was that one. I had him do, um, do a duet with himself as two women. So that was great. So Nick told us that sometimes authors won't be prepared in terms of like, how do you want them to sound? Or how do you pronounce a name? Have you been guilty of yeah. that at all? Like, has Nick ever come to you and been like, so how do I pronounce this name? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> so you uh, I would say I'm at both ends of that spectrum horribly. So um, uh, he's got some, uh, and it's not just him, but, but a lot of authors, um, they write the manuscript and then they're done, right? Um, and since I came to writing later in life, uh, after having kids, that my books are like additional kids. Um, and so when I handed off the manuscript, um, that's the beginning of the work, right? So, so he and I actually spend a fair bit of time collaborating uh, on every voice. Um, and it's gotten a lot faster over the years because I'm like, it's a little bit like, you know, a little bit like Misha, a little bit like Megan, all these different characters, and then we, we, we are able to collaborate really quickly. Um, but so for all of my character names, I know all of the pronunciations. Uh, I know how to do all of that. And, and we do a pronunciation guide at the beginning of each book, just if there's new characters. So I never, I never make him guess on that. However, uh, I, am, I am absolutely horrible at um, geography names and historical names. So um, I like to do a little, some Forrest Gumpy type things uh, where uh, if you know from Forrest Gump where he would be in historical scenes. Um, so, and we saw that um, in Trinity's Children, the, um, uh, the Dr. Uh, Howard character uh, is relating some of his experiences back all the way back to Nazi Germany and so forth. Um, and so there was uh, uh, one of the, the scientists that unfortunately worked with uh, Dr. Mengele um, was uh, referenced in the book. And he's like, how do you pronounce that? I'm like, I, I, I just write it. It's, it's historically accurate. My work is done. Um, and then with, uh, uh, with in Trinity's Children, a lot of the Asian names, like the name of the shuttle, the name of the, 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 the um, location on the moon where the Chinese um, went uh, recently onto the dark side of the moon. All of those things, I have no idea. So um, I have no idea how they're pronounced or anything else. And then um, in, in Sentinels, there's a lot of um, ga ga Scotch Gaelic profanity when Shannon, one of the main characters, uh, gets her gets her uh, her ire up. And he's like, how do you pronounce this? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. It's, it's Scotch Gaelic. I'm Polish and that's it. <laughs> so. that's awesome so you mentioned that you were i love this phrase a little late to the game with writing like so you started in your later years do you mind sharing just a little bit of like um maybe some of your story with that whether you know that's your kind of upbringing or how you got into writing and at what stage and kind of what your your home life is like a little bit without getting too personal <laughs> Yeah, um, so I, I, the scene from Steve Martin and the jerk just slashed through my head, uh, which I, I, which probably you can't even say nowadays because because uh, half the things would get you canceled. So um, the yeah, so I, you know, I I, I guess um, at a very early age I loved stories. Um, my mom, I was really blessed. My mom read to me. She read me *Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, which was the first book that I remember uh, that that series, um, and that's actually uh, figures figures into um, the Sentinel series uh, in, uh, in book six, the, la uh, the second to last book. Um, but I really uh, enjoyed stories and I used to, uh, if you, back in the day, because I'm dating myself, if you had a radio and you, and you pegged it to right at the edge where what the bands met, you could pick up uh, PBS on your radio. So uh, I found uh, and listened to uh, the entirety of Lord of the Rings um, uh, as a, uh, this was really before audiobooks, but as a performance, right? So, so it was the full cast uh, and I listened to that. 
And uh, I was a really, uh, you know, kind of imaginary, imaginative kid. Uh, one of those ones that just was constantly not paying attention in, in, in class most of the time. So I had all these stories in my head and, and, and I, I actually thought that was what everybody was like. Um, and so I could create these worlds and characters and all sorts of different things. Um, and, and so I did and, and um, dabbled with writing, but um, wasn't very good to be perfectly honest. Uh, my, my, uh, my first uh, book, which will never see the light of day, um, <laughs> thank God. Uh, it, it just, um, <laughs> it, there's, and I write this in one of my author's notes is that there's some authors that are just gifted in terms of being able to imagine a story and then put the words to it. Um, and then there's some that, that have to have kind of life experiences, teach them how to do that. And I'm certainly in, in the latter. I can imagine all sorts of different things, but my writing was very stilted and pretentious uh, when I first started. Um, and you, for me, I needed to live the life experiences that I have um, of being, you know, um, a husband and a father, a uh, father to one adopted uh, son and uh, two biological kids, uh, one of which has uh, some special needs. All of these things go into the, the, the crucible of creating a human being, right? Um, so a lot of the, the, those relationships go into my character uh, and my, my books are real character driven. So most of the uh, positive feedback that I get is related to kind of the, the character interplay. Uh, and and you, you probably noticed that from, from how, uh, Jay, how the, they talk to each other is that the, I, I guess one of the, the biggest compliments or the best compliments I get is that they feel, these characters feel really real to me. Uh, and and uh, it's like I'm in a room watching them and it almost feels voyeuristic. Uh, and that's what I try to create is this, this, this scenario where these people are, you care about them and they feel really real. And these words and these dialogues are things that you could picture yourself saying at a bar with a friend or something else. Um, and I just, I, I didn't have the, the, the skills to do that um, uh, when I was younger. I had to, I had to grow into those, that, that ability. That's cool. I, uh, I totally get what you mean in terms of like, so your characters 100% do sound like real people, especially you know, there are scenes with Damien Howard um, and Coleman, and you can instantly tell like these two have a long history together. And that's right off the book. That was what hooked me. And uh, I enjoyed that. And then as you go further, younger Howard, um, sorry, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a younger version of Howard that may or may not show up. Um, and he feels like a completely different character too, to me. He didn't feel at all like the old one. I would say they weren't, weren't even close. So there, I totally am 100%. Uh, I can attest to that. Like if you want a book where the characters feel like characters and you can be involved and attached to their lives, this is the book for it. Your book is the book for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I appreciate that. It's kind of, um, there's some people that write amazingly great uh, detailed, um, like um, Diana Gabaldon, uh, the Outlander books. My wife loves those books. And, and she's like, you know, that she can she could write 30 pages on on the texture of the stone in a cottage um and um and and you really get the sense of of infusing you about the the the, the physicality of the area you're in and then so my books are kind of like that but with the characters so so the characters have lots of depth to them uh and then they operate in in a world that that has enough uh, detail to, so that, so that you as the re reader or the listener can fill in the gray areas um, and make it kind of your own. Um, and, um, and, and I think that that's, that's kind of what people really, really resonates uh, with the stories with them. I would say it's a satisfying plot that is character driven, like the story is character driven, but it has a satisfying plot, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. It's be better than the alternative, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, some some series that are very much plot driven rather than character driven and they can be okay if the writer is good at it but even still i i take character driven any day personally yeah i i, I would encourage you to to take a shot at the uh at the sentinels uh ones 
because um, the it'll be interesting for you. Um, and, and I don't know, Johnny. Did you did you? Uh, I just started it. I'm excited. Uh, uh, Trinity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Johnny's not as fast um, as me. He's a uh, he's a uh, he wanted to wait till the movie, and I convinced him <laughs> he needs to at least get going in this one. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to wait for the movie too. I've got I, I've got people that send me casting uh, characters. That's really fun, uh, and for the most part, I, I really like them. And it's awesome because like for within the Sentinels one, uh, there's it's a the the main female character is a ginger, and so I have all these really beautiful ginger women coming into my my inbox, and my wife's like, oh my god, uh, so she uh, I, it gives me it gives me license to have uh, all those things flying in there. But, but I think what you'll find interesting is, is the, uh, the contrast between the first book, the first Sentinels book and the first Paradigm book, uh, because the first uh, Paradigm book is written six years after the first Sentinels book. So um, sometimes I, I cringe a little and I was on a panel for Dragon Con with a guy that had the best answer for this. He's, he's smarter than me, but he's a doctor. So what do you expect? <laughs> um, and, and um, and I go, you know, when um, when people start my Sentinel series, I always am a little self-conscious because if you if in anything you do, you should get better at your craft, whether you're a blacksmith or you're a writer. So um, when you look at the first Sentinels book and you look at the first Trinity book or the first uh, Paradigm book, the uh, just just the, the the tactic or the technical craft work between the two um, is significantly different. So. Things you learn along the way, like um, an optimal chapter length is, is really around 2,000 to 3,500 words, you know. And I had I have a chapter I think in in the first Sentinels it's like 7,000 words, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and because you know, who knew, right? Th yeah. These are things you you learn along the way as and and how to to pace things and and it makes it's it's less important in audiobooks because people are not as chapter as chapter driven as they are in, in print books. You know, I'm just going to get to one more chapter and then I'm going to put it down, those kinds of things. So I've, I got a lot of feedback that are like, you know, when I say I want to get through one more chapter before I go to sleep and now it's four in the morning. So it's a compliment <laughs> to me that, that they want to keep going, but they're like, could you make shorter chapters so I can go to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> or at least have a break in the chapter somewhere, you know, end in it a little there. <laughs> yes. Like a, the, the Florons. Yes. <laughs> My thing is I actually have to, a lot of times with my books, I have to kind of stop in the middle of a chapter because a lot of the authors I read like to have like a cliffhanger at the end of the chapter. And so then I have to start up the next one because I can't end on a cliffhanger. So I like, someone's in the middle of talking and I'm like, ah, oh, you know what, here's a good spot. I just fold the page and call it good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good pacing though, to, to drive someone from one, from one chapter to the next. I, I must admit I'm a little guilty of that myself sometimes. Yeah, definitely. I would say you definitely are. <laughs> Johnny. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise you though, Robert, because I've been, uh, Jay's got me into audiobooks, and that's all I did this summer. Like I always say, Nick is the soundtrack of my summer. And what I really liked about starting yours, and it's something you mentioned, but I didn't realize it till actually listening to it. Cause I've been listening to Terry Goodwin, all the fantasy that they do. Mm -hmm. Your pace for audio makes so much more sense than this like narrative driven. It's like, it's a much easier dialogue. And I really like that about listening to your audiobooks. How do you, you write for audiobooks, I feel like. That's that's actually accurate. So so um, the one thing that I knew when I started the the Sentinels books was that I wanted to do audio books, um, partly because of some of the uh, what I mentioned with my with one of my my kids um, who has um, uh, part of his challenges is is uh, dyslexia and has a hard time reading, can't get through a novel. So um, I wanted to create stories for people that would be able to consume them. In whatever format they want it. So I knew I wanted to go uh, print and ebook and audiobook. Um, and uh, it's really interesting when you when you um, when you write for audio first. Um, it it's harder, um, but it makes the print bit better too, uh, because you're much more conscious of um, the verbal identifiers. So like John said, Jay said, Fred said, you don't. You, you, you have to write your dialogue so that you don't have all that every time. So you have to have some creative ones. And then if somebody is in, is in a, like, a, like a real dense conversation, like within it's with just two people, you can drop those entirely. So then you can just go from one to the other. And then you rely on your voice actor to be able to make sure that the listener 
is able to keep track of who it is that they're talking to. Um, so in, um, um, I got myself into big trouble in one of the Sentinels books because the, um, the Shannon character, the, the ginger, um, she was going, was, was going, had, there was some timey wimey stuff and she was, she ended up meeting herself at, at, a, at a younger age, which was okay when she was meeting herself at, she was 32 and she was meeting a 14 year old. But then when she's meeting herself at 27, I was like, uh oh, because, <laughs> because how do I, how do I, it was like three quarters of the way through the book. And then I realized, how's Nick going to do this? So I just texted him and I was like, hey, by the way, start thinking about how you're going to differentiate between <laughs> Shannon at 27 and Shannon at 33. I'm sure you'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, that's a, a quick side note. That's really cool about the audiobooks because I, I suffer from dyslexia as well. And we had another author and it helped him because uh, he, he was a lawyer and it helped him take test audiobooks and learning how to pay attention. And I was like, that is something that I've never liked reading, but now I can't take enough of it. So it's really cool that you understand and you get it from that perspective of making it for us. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, I think stories are the most amazing thing. Um, uh, and um, I, there's, there's, we're, we're, we're I, I really, one of the things I don't like about some of the, some of the um, content that's being produced like by, by big studios now is that they, it's it's like they have a message they want to deliver, but they deliver it without any subtlety. Like here's the message I want, and then here's a big hammer in which I will crush your skull until the, you 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 go. I got it. Uh, I I get the message you're trying to get me to hear. But I think that most uh, authors have a message too, and in embedded in 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 my stories, every one of them has kind of a thematic, um, a moral thematic to it. Um, and, uh, but I try to be really subtle with it to the point where people ask me like, Hey, did you mean for this? And sometimes they see things that aren't there, but most times it's, it's, they're unraveling that, that very kind of slender thread that I've tried to put in there, uh, because there's a message that I want people, uh, to be able to consume. And then that gets back to the, um, uh, the line, the witch in the wardrobe. Now, now C.S. Lewis was, was his, his thread was a Christian, uh, thread. And he, it was pretty specific, right? So, but even that was less, was more subtle than, than, you know, some of the, uh, the, the, the big studios uh, are, are, are being now. But, um, uh, but that allegorical stuff where, you know, people represent things and locations represent things. I think that that, that creates um, a real, you know, kind of rich uh, tapestry to, to weave together a story. I totally get what you mean. Just as a quick aside, um, there was a scene in the newest Captain Marvel movie um, where the song I'm Just a Girl plays in like the final battle. And I was like, do you guys have to hit it like so hard over the head? Like it kind of pulls me out of the movie to make this statement so over the top. And then if you contrast that with Wonder Woman, when they say it's no man's land, no one's getting across this. She says, well, I'm going to get across it. I was really grateful that she didn't say I'm not a man and then started walking across it. Cause that would have again, pulled me out of the movie, but instead it, I really enjoyed that scene where wonder woman crosses no man's land. Um, so I, I know what you mean by that. I, I appreciate that you don't hit us over the head with a sledgehammer uh, <laughs> in order to get your points across. Yeah. I think that that's a great contrast. The, the, the captain Marvel and the, and the wonder woman, um, which um, the, which is, and Wonder Woman is just a great movie, not to mention that Gal Gadot is absolutely gorgeous. It, it, she's the only female <laughs> actress that is 100% crushed on by all, all the people in my family, including my wife and daughter. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's like, there you go. Um, it, it's, it was, it's like the female equivalent of uh, my kids having to grow up with, with me with my, my man crush on, on Tom Welling as, as, young, as young Superman. Oh, um, right there too, Smallville, yep. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so... Um, uh, so yeah, I, you know, I liken it cause I'm a big Blade Runner fan and I try to slip those things in as, as, and you, you, you know, you're, you've read Trinity. So you know that, uh, that, that I got to, I got to really expand on that a little bit, uh, in Trinity's children. But, um, have you guys seen, uh, that movie Blade Runner? Uh-huh. I've seen all the movies. I need to catch up <laughs> with Blade Runner. Um, 
the first one came out before my time and the new one came out and i i don't want to watch the new one without seeing the old one so i'm stuck in no, the should... paradox <laughs> <laughs> so so it's funny because i think i probably have bought that movie like eight times because <laughs> they kept re-releasing new versions um but the to tie it to this point was there's um uh, the theatrical release of the movie uh, has this voiceover uh, about what's going on in some real critical scenes. Um, and the director, the final cut, the director's final cut, and, and many, every director cut, and then the final cut where he got to do absolutely everything he wanted, um, doesn't. And, and it gets back to respecting your audience, right? Um, the, the theatrical release basically was like, you're too stupid to understand what we're doing. So allow me to put a voiceover track to walk you through everything that's happening. Um, and I happen to think that people are more clever than that. So um, in, my, in my stories, there is no metaphorical voiceover. Those, those subtle themes are, are, are there. Uh, if you want to find them, then you can. Uh, if you don't, then you can just enjoy a good romp uh, uh, with uh, some fun, fun loving people that get themselves into um, really obscene situations. <laughs> what other, what are, so you, you love Blade Runner. I know Star Trek comes up in it. Um, I think Star Wars makes a brief appearance, but Star Wars wasn't one that was like hammered. I, I remember there being references, but it wasn't, it was, I thought Star Trek was more heavily hit. Um, so what, give us some background into like your nerd universe, you know, growing up and <laughs> everything. Let's hear, like so, you touched on some, let's hear all of it. Yeah, so um, uh, Johnny Sacco's Flying Robot was was uh, <laughs> was my uh, first uh, first love in terms of, of sci-fi. That was you know you, I'm again dating myself. You get this is you know this is back what UHF. Do you guys even know what UHF is? <laughs> yeah, that's a different channel. <laughs> the so U, UHF was the uh, you had VHF. And you had UHF, and UHF was the the, the VHF was the, the the bunny ear antennas, right? And the UHF was like a little little disc, and the UHF was <laughs> for like channel thirty three and up, and you could never get UHF to come in right, but UHF was where the good stuff was for the kids, right? <laughs> so Johnny Sacco's Flying Robot was during that that uh, Japanese uh, pre anime kind of thing, uh, you know the the monsters were all in rubber suits stomping around miniature cities and the boats all had sparks that shot out as they zoomed across places. And Johnny Saka's flying robot was a flying robot that looked like uh, he had a head of an Egyptian pharaoh. Um, so, and you, and that's actually referenced uh, by um, uh, uh, in Ready Player One. So, uh, which was a, a great little Easter egg for, for, for people in the book, not the movie. So the, oh, okay. the movie, the <laughs> I was movie, like, uh, where is it? Where is it in my head? <laughs> no, the, that, that audio book was absolutely outstanding. And, and it's, um, but a lot of, a lot of it did make it to, tra to translation into the, into the movie. Uh, things about, about Rush, uh, the, the, the band Rush and a bunch of other really cool stuff from the, from the books didn't make it into the, into the movie, but Johnny Sock flying robot. So that was, so that was, that was uh, my first, uh, you know, um, nerd kind of nerdgasm, uh, <laughs> was, was that, uh, and that was, that always competed with Ultraman. So you had Ultraman people and good Johnny Sacco people. And, and I was totally a, a, a Johnny Sacco person. Um, and then, so Star Trek, obviously Star Trek was, was, uh, was brilliant, uh, in terms of, uh, being able to put those kind of, um, uh, societal issues, embedded in there i mean you had the first uh interval kiss my one of my favorite star trek movies uh which is really formative in, in some of my writing because i put these moral themes in there um uh i think it's jack gorshin the guy who played the joker uh in in the 1960s batman so there was a there was a scene i don't know if you guys are familiar with star trek but there was a there was a show where the um the species had a white side of their face and a black side of their face. So they, let's say that their left side was white and their black side or their right side was black. And, the, and the, there had been civil war forever. And so, so Kirk and company went in to try to make peace, as I recall, right? And, and the, 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 the climax scene is where these, the, the Jack Gorshin or the Gorshin character is like, how can you expect us to, to make peace with those people? 
And, and Kirk's like, I don't understand. You guys are exactly the same. And he's like, we're not the same at all. He's white on his left side and I'm white on my right side. And I was like, <laughs> you know, cause, because obviously, you know, you, you know what they're going for, right? Like these, these superficial things are not what should be separating us and certainly not having us treat each other inhumanely. Um, but by, by taking uh, the, the, the real differences that we have societally and, and, and skewing it to the, to the ludicrous, right? Well, it's not just that you're, you're two different colors, right? But it's just which color is on which side and that's enough to create war, right? So, so that, that was, was, was really impactful uh, for me too, because my dad was in, was, is a career Marine. And uh, so we didn't, we didn't really grow up. Uh, we, it wasn't tolerated in our family to grow up with some of those um, prejudices, even though we, we, we definitely grew up in different areas where some of that took place. Uh, but, uh, but Marines, uh, you know, the, the only colors they, they, my dad used to say was the only colors they see are uh, scarlet, blue, and gold. Uh, those are the only colors that we're allowed to see. Um, and, uh, so that, that kind of flows through some of my, some of my, uh, stories too. Like with Trinity, um, the publisher was like, when did you write this? I, I said, you know, I said, I, well, it's 170,000 words, so it's been a while. Uh, mm -hmm. but it was published during this past summer, right? When we have all of, you know, we have the, the, the Black Lives Matter and the, um, uh, the, the protests and the riots and all this other kind of stuff with, uh, George Floyd and, and, uh, Breonna Taylor, Taylor and other people, right? And so she's like, how did you write this so topically? And I was like, no, no, I was like, this is just my writing. Um, but um, could, because the, for those who are maybe watching this, the, the main character in Paradigm 2045 is a woman named uh, Charlotte Omandi. Uh, and she's a Kenyan woman uh, who becomes thrust into the, the whirlwind of, of, of what the, the entire plot is about. Um, so, um, so I've gotten a lot of questions like, did you write this because of 2020? And I was like, like, I can't write that fast, nor am I that, that, that smart to, to do that. So this story was what the story was. Charlotte Omandi appeared to me, which is what happens with my characters. And she was who she was. So I've had people go, why is this character gay? Or why is this character black? I'm like, because that's who they are, right? Um, that's when they show up. They show up, like they literally show up. It's freaky. Um, and that's who they are. And I, I, stay, I stay true to, to what they are when they show up. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it's one of the most diverse casts. There's a show called Community, where the Dean jokes about like, how they're a very diverse group of people. And that was a joke I almost wanted to make about the book, because you've got a Scotsman, a Russian, you've got a Kenyan. Um, and then I think you've got two Americans. I know um, Dr. Howard's American, and then there was one other. I thought, isn't um, the, the telepath American? Am I remembering wrong? No, she's Scandinavian. Scan okay, okay, that's right. Sorry, you, you put so many in, I can't even keep track of it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and it's, a, it's fair because she, uh, uh, she, has, uh, she doesn't have a Scandinavian accent. Right. Um, uh, so she has, she has kind of a nondescript American accent um, because uh, it was distracting. Uh, when, when we ended up doing the voice, the voice, uh, Anal uh, analysis with all the different characters talking to each other. Uh, I ended up pulling pulling the uh, the Scandinavian accent from um, from the initial uh, when we did the initial voice test. Got it. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. I, so yeah, that, I thought that's it was, why I thought that because I was like I don't remember yeah. her having an accent, but I do know that she she can tweak accents in the in the book. She can she can right. do whatever accent she wants. Right. Her her uh, genetic. Uh, one of her genetic enhancements is to to be able to translate languages at the phoneme level. So um, so all languages are are predicated on like 64, I think, phonemes, uh, and then those are just reorganized in different ways for every language. So that's she she's like a walking babblefish from uh, from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. So so you're asking about influences. So um, so so Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, Doctor Who was a huge influence for me. Um, Doctor Who is, is all throughout um, the Sentinel series um, uh, as, a, as an homage to, to him. Uh, my, my doctor was the fourth doctor, Tom Baker with the scarf. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I've gotten my kids uh, and wife all into the, 
the reboot from 2005. Uh, and we hotly debate whether or not um, David Tennant or Matt Smith are the, are the best I, doctor. I, I, I always lean towards David. That's me. Matt Smith took a while to get me to love him. I love David right off the bat. That's how I settle the arguments when I get into it. Well, that's true. And, and because, you know, if you, if you were like us, when, when David Tennant uh, uh, regenerated into Matt Smith, my, my son captured it perfectly. He goes, Matt Smith can suck it. <laughs> exactly. That's how I felt too. I, I, I'm with him on that. Second that. Right. So, so he had to over, overcome all that. Uh, and oh, then, that's, um, yeah, I guess that's right. To win your heart. And, yeah. And, and whereas, whereas with uh, the ninth doctor going into David Tennant, I'm like, what? You just got here. What are you doing, dude? <laughs> And you can't regenerate after one season. So I was pissed at him. So I was, pre <laughs> you know, I was predisposed to liking David. And then, you know, obviously he just inhabited uh, that character um, wonderfully. Um, but um, for, for you, Jason, you'd be starting it sooner than, than, than Johnny. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the second Sentinels book um, uh, has a, a very strong uh, tie-in between uh lucifer and doctor who which you would say how does that work <laughs> it's it's fun so i won't i won't say what my guess is but i feel like i have a guess on that um i think you'd be wrong but i'll, but I'll okay. tell you what i'll bet, I'll, I'll bet you a dollar that you're wrong <laughs> because someone's like how have. many how much drugs were you taking when you wrote that chapter <laughs> So I don't, uh, so this is, this is a nerd fashion for me. I haven't watched a ton of Doctor Who. I know what the storylines are and I know who the doctors are, um, but I haven't sat down and watched through it all, mostly because it's such a big commitment that I'm like, I don't know if I want to get pulled into that wormhole. Like that's a- These aren't long story. chapters, Jay. They're like eight episodes long. Come on. Yeah, season. but there's like 47 England. seasons, Johnny. <laughs> Just watch 2005 to now and you'll be fine. Okay, right. I'll do that. I'll do that. Start if you I, if you watch Blink, you'll never go back. That's what I do with people that I want to torture. I'm like, just watch one, just watch Blink, and then they watch that and they're like, okay, now I have to go uh, back and watch them all. I still get terrified. I joke. We have a, we play Dungeons and Dragons, and and to this day we still get nervous by like the Weeping Angels. Like we're just like Doctor Who has a lot of stuff that can scare you. It, it, it's not just for kids. Right? Oh, it's great. So so it, it filed under bad parenting. We had this <laughs> this uh, this angel. Um, in um in our front yard uh like a stone angel and after the doctor who the statue and we moved it into the hallway <laughs> and so one of the kids the, came, she came out of the bathroom and she's like ah! <laughs> and and that was i mean I, we, we tried to say we were balancing it out because after the the, the movie the ring came out if you guys <laughs> ever saw that my daughter was was young and I, we had her wet her hair and put it over her head and then she walked into her older brother's room like that uh, so then he shrieked so we were like well we did that to him so we had to do something to you because there's no more kids you're turning the children uh, against themselves that's amazing I, <laughs> I will do i haven't gotten too far but i've i've, I've felt a little bit of battle star in it galacta maybe because it's like I just, I, I uh, felt that, that the first few seasons of that still get me crying. So I just, when I was listening to it, I was like, wait a minute, I'm feeling a little, uh, little Adama running around to feel a little inspiration going through. Yeah, that's a great catch. In fact, if you, um, if you look at the uniforms, mm -hmm. uh, my daughter created the uniforms from the, for the cover and that are referenced and the uniforms are a, a mashup of um, uh, next generation, the Expanse uh -huh. and Battlestar. So oh, she took okay. one one segment from each of them, and then she loves drawing and, and fashion, and so she created the uniforms out of elements from all of those. Um, and so yeah, the, um, the the one of the reviews uh, of it was uh, if um, uh, I think it was if Battlestar Galactica, the Expanse, and um, and and Blade Runner had a baby, it would be this <laughs> book. And it's Battlestar um, where they everyone's called Sir, right? That was one element you threw into there, Sir. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the, so they Battlestar was the first one that did that, and then the Expanse uh, picked that up that that thread as well. Um, and um, and uh, in in the Paradigm book, it's uh, for you know you 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 know it already, but but it's called out 
and and the reason why it makes sense is the um the 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 patriarch of the series uh if you will dr howard a long a long lived 175 year old person he uh he loved those things so and he's you know he's he's a trillionaire and and he's can do whatever he wants for the most part except live forever um and um so he was basically like, I like Battlestar Galactica, and I don't really want to have these kinds of uh, these gender issues. So we're just going to all call each other the same thing. <laughs> and and then some of the other characters are like, well, that's stupid. He's like, too bad. <laughs> so so from the author perspective, I don't have to take a position as to whether it's good or bad because I could put that on Howard's shoulders. He did it. Right, and he's <laughs> putting it on Battlestar Galactica's shoulders. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you've gotten so, it so far away from I yourself. have so much plausible deniability that I'm good. <laughs> and I, as long as I don't mention it on Twitter, where we're in um, So real quick, before we, so we're starting to jump really into Paradigm. Um, would it be okay if we just did a quick, like, this is what the book is about. We're going to give you a quick, you know, for the people who haven't read it, this is a, like an intro or a. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Little, sure. So, 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 um, uh, Paradigm 2045 is based in the year 2045. Um, and the, the, the premise is that um, in 1945, we, we split the atom. Um, and that, um, that, that made us a, a species of interest um, because there was um, a other other civilizations out there that determine that once a species is capable of splitting the atom they're capable of making trouble so they they developed over the years a set of criteria that that a species needs to pass as kind of like uh hurdles that to, that they would become good members of a galactic community and they they had 100 years to pass that up or if they didn't then um they got exterminated so the um, uh, for the good of for the good of the galaxy, uh, and so the book taking place in the in in the last six months or so before this grace period ends, um, and uh, and covers the story of how uh, humanity will either um, pass those tests uh, or not. Uh, and it tees up the, the the moral challenge of do the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one uh, through the rest of the series, uh, where it unfolds whether or not that really was their motivation was for the good of the galaxy, or did they have a darker motivation, which I tease in the first book, but is really explored in the second. And then the ramifications of that are uh, are, are fully revealed in in the in the third book. Um, so that's kind of the kind of the, the big arc. Uh, and there's some little heroic journeys in there um, in the in the first book with a, when they have first contact. Uh, it's with a member of the, the uh, one of this this civilization species that doesn't agree that it's a moral good to um, to uh, exterminate a race even if they pose a threat uh, because they haven't done it yet. So it's kind of a little bit of minority report there, right? Can you can you can you convict someone? based on what they are likely to do versus what they have done. Um, and that, that, that's ex explored as well. Did that do a pretty good job? You read it, so you yeah. Yeah, <laughs> No, 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 so the humanity has to reach some criteria. One of them, and this was my favorite one, was they have to create a ship that can go faster than the speed of light. Um, and, and the reason I like that one so much, so they're pre the way it all kind of starts is they find a, an alien shuttle and then an avatar shows up and explains this to them like, hey, you're, you're on the chopping block. So chop, chop, Dr. Howard, who's the really old and genius, um, really old genius character who, who kind of sets everything into motion. Um, and I would, I would, I don't know if this came from D&D &D or not, but the, the alien species reminded me of Dragonborns. I don't know if you've played any D&D &D or not. Um, oh, yeah. I actually <laughs> was D&D &D when Gary Gygax uh, version one. <laughs> It was, uh, uh, I, I, the criteria for being able to play D and D in school is you had to be, uh, willing to go into the quote gifted program, uh, which was, which was ludicrous for me anyway. But, but I was like, so I get to play D and D if I'm in the gifted program, what is this gifted program and what must I do? Well, you're going to have to do good in math. Damn it. All right. It's worth it. 
so yeah, I played D and D a lot. So, um, so yeah, they're they're uh, they they have a little bit of Dragonborn. They have a little bit of um, uh, uh, what is the uh, the Elder Scrolls race, uh, the uh, Beans of an Eye, uh, Ithrix or something like that. Um, and I think Nick does a great job of elongating the S's for those okay. characters. He does a great job in the, in, in acting uh, as uh, the Dracaf is the name of the species in the book, um, and he does a great job of that. My favorite part of it is they, you know, they find the avatar and they don't know if it, it's listening to them or not. And Dr. Howard is like, oh, if we need to do some biological uh, experimenting, I can take over <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> like, he was kind of being a little Freudian, a little subtle there. And I lost it. I thought that was so funny. That line. And then there's one other where um, she asks him, like, have you reached uh, light speed yet? And he says, no, I'm a little short on warp drives at the moment. Like, come on, lady. Like, what are you talking about? Right. So funny. Right. Yeah, and that and, and I try to I try to weave humor in every one of my books because uh, I think it's a, it's a great counterbalance to some of the seri more serious themes. And one of the funny funniest things that because I have to listen to my own books when I'm prepared to the next book, right? And I find myself like an idiot, like if I'm listening in the car where I laugh at my own jokes, it's very meta, <laughs> and I'm like, that's really funny. And but but with the way the way your minds work is you don't remember stuff from if we remembered everything we did three years ago, we'd never get out of bed. <laughs> um, so, so like I, I, I listened to a book I wrote six years ago and a scene comes up that I don't remember at all. And then something happens and I, I start laughing and I have to look around and make sure no one sees me. Cause I feel like an idiot <laughs> laughing at my own jokes. That's funny. Cause we'll have like our friends listen to this and sometimes our, uh, our post that they're a little delayed and I just forget. They'll be like, that was so funny. And I start laughing like, Johnny, you said that <laughs> we're repeating you. I'm like, Oh, all right, cool. I'm glad I said it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was gonna gonna say that Damien Howard is my favorite character to to me he's introduced right at the beginning and he just kind of feels like some dude who just came from a safari like he almost reminds me of like a Teddy Roosevelt or I don't even know what which I don't think that's necessarily how you meant to present him but it's just how I started to picture him in my head like he's just off the cuff like haha I can do this and he's gonna jump off a cliff and he's one of those characters that's just like dude has got a super red personality to me uh super go-getter and I, I i really uh i'm i don't have a red personality at all i've got a very like on the color spectrum of personalities i'm very blue um so sometimes i attach to those characters because they're like who i wish i was at times so i really attached to howard and he cracked me up throughout the uh the series both in, in all the versions that you may or may not see of him <laughs> yeah um it's interesting you say that because he is uh he's He's definitely somebody that I'd say a blue person can live vicariously through him. Um, one of the most, you know, I get different kinds of reviews. I get reviews that are just like, you know, wow, this is great fun. And then I have people that like peel it back and they, they try to look for all that internal stuff. Sometimes they see more than I even put there. Um, but with, with Damien, his arc from the beginning to the, to the last, uh, scene between him and Omandi when when he's going to earth and he um uh he places himself under her command he's the one that created all of this but he is under her authority and she sends him uh you know off uh on a mission uh and um and he looks at her and tells her what she means to him um because he starts off you know and he's just he's he's brush he's, he's brusque and he's and he's got a focus and he and he he has dark humor, uh, but but he isn't necessarily warm and fuzzy. No. Right? Uh, but that last scene with with Charlotte, where he really is vulnerable, uh, and he's he because she's like a daughter to him, um, which again was important to me because that contrast of races, right? So so he views her as as his daughter, the daughter he never had, uh, despite her being from Kenya and him being from Britain because it doesn't matter to, to them, right? There are so many other things that, that, are, that, that they have to work through because literally the species, the, our species is, a, is uh, at threat. Yeah, I, uh, we don't want to take up all your time. So we're going to start <laughs> towards the ending here. Um, oh, sure. But I, I am really looking forward to book two. Um, I thought now that, you know, you do a really good job of introducing the characters and you get to know them. And I feel like now that I've, 
got all these characters in my head and I've got them fleshed out. I'm excited to see like how it's going to go in terms of uh, now that they, you know, you don't have to spend time developing them. They can just be witty and they can just go crazy and I get to see how they react and I get to enjoy it. And I'm excited for that. If that makes sense. Like the due diligence period is over for these characters. Right. <laughs> no, first, too. first books. Uh, I wrote about this one of my author's notes. I, I've decided I hate first books um, <laughs> uh, because there's, it, it's, it's so much work trying to figure out who these people are. Um, and, um, but then, uh, and I think Sentinels is a great example because I, again, I put it in the author's note, which makes me sound a little insane, which is fine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, like starting in book three of the Sentinel series, um, I, I, I picture scenes. I, I like, I know these different things are going to happen. And I, I basically, put the people in there and I take notes on what they do. Um, and that's the dialogue. That's the story because I know them well enough and they know how they're going to react that if I know, and I put them in this environment, they're going to do something. I don't necessarily know what it's going to be. So when I talk about being uh, an outline and a, a hybrid outline discovery writer, so out outline authors, they outline everything and, and then they follow their outline. And, and it's, it's just nothing wrong with that. Discovery uh, authors don't know really anything and they're just kind of writing as it, as it unfolds. So I have a really rough outline so I know there's going to be these kinds of scenes, um, but I don't really know what's gonna happen within them. And then the characters go into the scene and then they are who they are. So it's, it's like in, in, for, for you in, in Trinity, uh, if I were to put you know, James and Misha in a, in a room, you know, uh, James is not going to start talking about, you know, thermodynamics um, or the fine points of navigation. You know, if someone's like, well, how are you going to get from point A to point B? He's like, it'll work out, you know, <laughs> I, because I'm awesome. Yeah. Uh, John, and, John and, Crichton approach. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and conversely, if it was, if it was, if it was, um, you know, um, Dr. Carpenter, you know, in, in, in a room, and someone did something horrible, he would be like, well, now let's, let's not overreact. <laughs> I agree that he just said something really hateful to you, but maybe he was having a bad day, you know? <laughs> uh, and that's, that's what you would, but you don't know that in the first book. You don't know who these people are. Um, with the second Trinity's book, the, the, the challenge that I'm having is that you're not gonna take a, a starship X number of light years, which was a pain to try to figure out how far they're going, <laughs> um, with a with a crew of nine people, right? Because they're they're all kind of archetypical, right? You have one doctor, you have one navigator, you have you have one in engineer. Like if you lose any of them, mm -hmm. you know you're screwed, right? So you got to have a backup. So in the last chapter of of Trinity, they're talking about how they're gonna they're gonna assemble the crew for this next stage the second book humanity's promise so uh they, they they add 60 people to this to this ship now i'm not going to flesh out 60 people plus the original 10 because that would be insane uh, the only good part about that would be to try to watch nick juggle it but um <laughs> uh but you have to take another set of people and they need to be secondary characters that you care about that aren't red shirts you know uh but that aren't that don't take away from the primacy of the first characters uh, because those are those are our our crew, right? Those are the ones that that, that the listeners are 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 kind of invested in. So that's kind of been been the challenge of adding really another ten people to the mix, so they can they can pop, pop in and pop out um, and have their own kind of unique characteristics. But they're 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 kind of supplementary. You know, it's an extra doctor, it's an extra navigator, uh, but they all have to have some screen time, so you care. I love that. Hey, so I, I kind of want to start wrapping up, but I had one last question for you as, as an sure. inspiring writer. Um, how do you make things so frustrating sometimes? I, and I, I want to <laughs> say this with context in, in the series of the books, the governments of the world are the most frustrating thing I've ever had to get through. And I mean that in a positive way, like it pulled me in so much. How did that, how did that even come to you to have you know, the government's just stepping on people's toes and just pulling crap. Like, wh where did that come from? Where did that inspiration come from? Because I thought that was one of the coolest plot points that I don't see a lot 
that pulled me in to have kind of this, like, I don't know, think people just mucking up the situation, you know? Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, that gets to the point I raised earlier about life experiences. You know, um, I think that by the time you get to be 50, uh, you know, and I'm over 50, and you've raised kids, you've gone through so many interactions with governmental entities um, and corporate entities. So, so it's like wherever people are gathered, they seek out power. Uh, some type, some personality types seek out power. And I've, and I've often said the best qualifying trait for someone to be president of the United States is that they don't want to be president of the United States, you know, uh, because the people that seek these roles probably shouldn't have them for a lot of times because they, they tend to uh, either at the beginning uh, or get corrupted and I don't mean like, like corruption, corruption, but they get the, the original thought gets corrupted and they, they start to think that they, they know, they know best. And then you, that gets multiplied by, by nations. So the point you're raising is like, all right, so, so if these, these people are not successive, everybody dies. Right. But the governments are like, yeah, but they should be doing it my way. Right. And oh, then yeah. you have two competing governments that are like, well, no, no, they should do it. They should, I, we can't, we can't let the, the Chinese help them <laughs> not get us killed. We have to be the ones that help us not get killed. Even if our conflict results in us getting killed. So, they, uh, it, it, oh, I want that. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's really just, just that it's just the human condition that, um, that, some some personality types, you know, like you, the colors, right? The red colors tend to to, to seek out power, um, and then you know the then you have the, the the bluer people that are just like, I'm sure it'll be fine. They, they're probably good people, and then you have the people in the middle that are like, what? what how did I end up with this? You know, <laughs> some some of the some of these rules are just 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 dumb, um, and um, or some of the motivations that people have uh, for for doing certain things are just just dumb. So, so um, that adds kind of some of that, that reality. I think it also gives the, the listener the ability to, to, to vent a little. They're like, yeah, you know what? That, these people are annoying. And, <laughs> and, and they, can, they can do that in, in the course of, their, um, uh, of their, their entertainment as opposed to having to, to like watch Fox News or CNN, where, where it's like, I, I want people to be able to escape from this constant droning, right? Um, but you can't ignore it. So you can create, you can create fun at it. And then your, your team, your team being able to continually get past them, you know, we're going to drop this roadblock Well, I'll go around it, you mm -hmm. know, uh, it allows you to identify with that team and go, yeah, you know, my team is, is going to show these dummies that that we're going to we're going to succeed despite them. Yeah, I love that. Um, I don't have any final notes. Johnny, do you have any final notes? No, I just uh, I was going to ask a long time ago because I have a hard time like listening to our podcast. I was wondering if you listen to your books when Nick does it. But you already answered that, which is great that you have to listen through Nick. <laughs> yep, uh, I, I, I listen to it. Um, uh, every chapter, he sends me a chapter, I listen to it, and then I give him feedback. Uh, and then um, when I'm prepping for the next book in the series, like I'm going to start uh, book seven, the last book in the Sentinel series, uh, probably in about four months, once uh, Humanity's Promise, the second paradigm book is done, or to beta, when it goes to beta, mm -hmm. then I'll start on the, the Sentinels. So I got to listen to all of those Sentinels books, um, so that I'm I'm up to speed because um, while, you know, I'm certainly no JK Rowling, uh, there, <laughs> the, enough people have started re listening and reading these books that, that I've gotten like continuity challenges. Like, Hey, this <laughs> happened in book one, but now in book six, you said this, I think you screwed up. <laughs> so I'm like, I probably did. Um, so, uh, so, you, so I've got some, some folks that are like actually paying attention. So I, and I really don't want to pull them out of the story by making stupid mistakes. I just want to make smart, very clever mistakes. Um, 
and uh, so so I actually have to pay pay a lot of attention because at six books in, you know, you're looking at like eight hundred thousand words, you know, that you have to get straight, which is like one George R. R. Martin novel I know, but but uh, still for 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 me it's a lot. Well, and that takes having it be separate books takes a lot of revision because each book you're not going to do that revision all at once. It's going to be this book needed six rewrites or whatever. So. Yeah, it goes through, um, I, you know, an initial draft, one revised draft, an alpha reading, which uh, is a gr very, very small group of people who are uh, sadists, um, mm -hmm. and they're very mean to me. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then it goes, uh, then uh, then uh, it's revised based on alpha. Then it, I, I print the books and send them out to about five different beta readers. Uh, then I get all the beta feedback. And then I go through uh, and then I send it finally to a copy editor uh, at the end. So it goes through, you know, a series of, um, of refinements, which is really good because I, I, I've had some real clunkers in ideas that my <laughs> alpha readers have been like, that can never happen. <laughs> so, I love that. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, they're mean. They're very mean people. Uh, and I put that in the, it, I, I hid there, uh, the, that reference uh, in the print book where I, I mentioned my alpha readers and I thank them for their sadistic tendencies and complete lack of humanity. Yeah, I don't think I caught that on the, I don't think it's on the Audible edition. That or, no. I didn't catch it, but that's awesome. No, uh, po Podium was not, was not excited about, about uh, <laughs> having Nick read that. So they, that got cut. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Johnny, any final thoughts? Um, uh, do you have any shameless plugs for us? Yeah, uh, we're going to say, where can we find all of uh, Robert Ross's, uh, all your stuff, all online, all on Amazon? Yeah, so all of the print and ebooks are available on Amazon. Uh, the audiobooks are available on Amazon and Audible. Um, my, uh, my website, uh, you can get to it either by robertwross.com or, or uh, spartamac.com s-p-a-r-t-a-m-a-c.com that's my publishing company um and um if you leave a review for all my books then you get unlimited access to all high-res art and uh two unreleased audiobooks uh done and that, done that um so i i really appreciate the time it takes for people to do those reviews and it's so important for people to find good stories as well as avoid them. And it sounds counterintuitive, but you know, money's tight. And, and the last thing I want is someone who's not going to dig a dig one of my books to, to pick it up uh, because they're not going to enjoy it. I'm not going to enjoy the review they leave if they leave <laughs> one. Um, and um, so really thoughtful reviews take time. And, and that's why I want to give back um, uh, what I can, which is the art and the, the, uh, the uh, unreleased audiobook, which is actually a novella, that ties together the world of paradigm and the world of sentinels. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a really interesting little Easter egg that ties those two worlds together. Very nice. Well, I'll so, be um, putting some new books this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The sixth sentinels book is going to be out in January. Uh, that's, uh, and then the second paradigm book uh, is due to be out at the end of August, if everything goes well. So that's, um, so those two are going to be out in 2021. Very nice. But I'm jealous of you, Jay, you, or actually both you guys, because you've got all those <laughs> books ahead of you. I, see, I, one of my favorite things is, is finding a series or an author that I like and there being a bunch of books because then I can just, yeah. I, can, I can go from one to the other. Um, and one of the things I promised folks is that they would get each book, God willing, unless something happened to me, every year they'd get a, they'd get a, a story and that's my commitment to them. Uh, because it's really frustrating when you're you're so invested in a in a character or or an author or a story, and then they like it's been two years, three years, whatever. And <laughs> as a fan as well as an author, when I when I when I wrote a Power Renewed, I, I didn't know it was going to be a series because until the market says that you're not a crappy writer, you don't know. <laughs> right? Until ten thousand people read your books and go, this is pretty good, right? So, so I, I've got that. So I've got tens of thousands of people that have read that book and they're like, this is pretty good. Um, so then if you're going to write a series, what I, because I'm a, a, again, a fan as well as an author, I was like, I'm not going to write this series unless I can commit to one, at least one book a year. Um, and um, because I, I don't want people to, uh, to get frustrated with me or the, or the characters. Um, 
So that's why uh, each year there's been a Sentinels book and each year there'll be a Paradigm book. Um, and, uh, and then there's also an ending. So sometimes I think authors don't end a series when they should. Uh, and I've run into a number of them as I've met them over the years. And I'm like, one of the things I, I said to the three different authors who've got series that have gone longer than seven books, I said, you know, it seems like you're angry with your characters. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, I, I, I'm not angry. I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated because I want to do a new series and my fans won't let me because every time I start a new series, they're like, well, yeah, but what about that one? Um, so that's when I decided that um, Sentinels was going to be seven, seven books and done. Trinity would be three and done. And it gives you, it empowers you as an author, like you, you have to get your story done, right? It's, you, you, it's not going to continue to stretch forever. Um, and then you can move on to something else, whether it's spinoff books that, that you revisit the characters or, or you don't, right? But, um, but you've got that definitive beginning, middle, and end. It also allows you to create some really interesting arcs, like the, if you, with the Sentinels, it's three up, a peak, three down. Uh, so you're able to do, like I did a really very specific cliffhangery thing at the end of book four in that series. Um, and you don't want to, I, at least I don't want to do a lot of um, cliffhangers because I think that it really is, it's not fun for a reader to have to wait a year to have something resolved. Mm -hmm. So I knew in that series there'd be one. Um, and then for, for people that have waited till, the, till five books are printed or sh shortly six, they don't have to wait, right? Um, and, but I won't be doing another one. So it's not like the, there's only one cliffhanger for that whole series. Awesome. Um, we would love to send you some stickers, um, whether or not you cool. use them or your children. We'd love to send you some. <laughs> We've got a bunch of different custom decals we send. Um, eventually, when we have a huge shipment of shirts, we'll send you one. Um, yeah. Do you have any shirts you want to shamelessly plug or any, any merch or anything that you want people to check out? Yeah, sure. Um, I got, you know, these. This is oh, uh, one so of the characters cool. from, Sen from, from Sentinels of Creation. Um, the, uh, you can get to that, that merchandise from spartamac.com. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a tag there. Um, for the most part, uh, I use a company called Pixels that does all my merch because they, they unlike a different um, company that's related to a color and a, a bubbly thing, um, <laughs> they, uh, I can make them affordable because I can... I, I set the, you can set how much money you as the, as the author want to make. And I set it really, really, really low. Cause the, the, I really, for people that love the story and they want to wear this stuff, I, I don't want to make a bunch of money off of them. I just want you to be able to get a nice shirt um, uh, or uh, a phone case or whatever. So, so uh, spartamac.com, there's a physical merch button and then you can go in there and buy a Trinity's children shower curtain. <laughs> they, which they actually have i'm like all right cool i just purchased a home so maybe that'll be with the one that we uh, put up there there you go you can have all that all that kind of stuff um yeah all right cool. so yeah i would love love to love to have you know stickers and stuff I'll, I'll be happy to to uh when i go to conventions and stuff be happy to bring yeah. them up. i was uh gonna say we're uh, i'm excited because our new thing now is to meet amazing people like you and authors and get their books and then meet you guys at cons and have you sign it. So uh, we're looking forward to when the world lets us have conventions again. Yeah, I hope so. I, I, I am going to right now I'm booked at Liberty con, um, which is in Chattanooga and dragon con uh, as, as a pro, as an attending pro at both of those. Uh, and obviously dragon con is next, next labor day. Uh, so God willing, we'll all be able to, to gather again. Um, you know, at, the, at that time, but I would love to see you guys there. Yeah, Dragon Con is one that we're we're trying to yeah trying to get ourselves into. So we'll <laughs> see if it happens. Um, we're we're a little more out west. Fanex is in Salt Lake, and that's a pretty big one. And we're gonna try and so we have some friends on the board there, and we're gonna see if we can get them to convince you know some of our friends that we've interviewed to <laughs> be flown out to Fanex. <laughs> I think it's top nice. five in the San Diego Comic Con in New York are the top two, and then I think Fanex falls in the top five um, for nerd conventions. Uh, like comic con conventions so pretty big yeah so if we can get you out we'll we'll try and do it we'll try and shamelessly get you out as much as we can <laughs> all right fair enough i i was out um that way 20 years ago i had a really good time <laughs> so, it's a long time ago but um but i liked it it was fun good people 
Yeah, well, um, we'll try head and head your way too. We're trying to we're trying to get ourselves nationwide. We'll see if it happens. <laughs> it's hard during a pandemic somehow. It's hard <laughs> weird. So yeah, I don't know. I know. Go figure. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> we're just we're just getting miles, uh, getting points now, accumulating points and saving it. We uh, we dub people uh, that are awesome enough to come because our our fans are knights, and then if we're our names are part of our podcast. Jay's the master of death. I'm the master of light. And then if you're cool enough to be on our cast, we dub you the master of something. Jay, did we sort out what we want to give uh, Robert here? Space. Just not baiting. Just don't, yeah. not like <laughs> no, fishing. No, 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 no. Master of, a, we'll call you the master of space because you know more about, as much about sci-fi as I do. And I can never get Jay to watch any of these shows. So glad to have someone on who knew, <laughs> actually knew what next gen meant. So that was a. <laughs> TNG. Yeah, there you go. So we'd like to thank uh, Robert, the master of space, amazing Woo-hoo. author, to spending some time with us. Thank you, guys. Love doing it, and um, ha- happy to you know to to revisit another time. Uh, I'm oh, sure you guys are going to be wonderfully successful, and uh, look forward to uh, watching you guys do great things and uh, seeing you on the convention circuit. That's yeah, exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, we'll have you back on when uh, when Trinity two that's not what paradigm when your second book in the paradigm series <laughs> comes out i don't think it'll be called trinity two <laughs> and we'll we'll do our own panel we'll we'll get nick to come back on and we'll just panel that'd be great a couple of couple of uh, nerdy friends going at it <laughs> yeah that would that would be awesome uh because we um we we, we definitely tend to to light each other up when we're Perfect. on the same panel <laughs> all right Can't nice wait. we will Can't see wait. you on the flippity flop flippity flop